the Biblical Book of Psalms consists of 150 individual poems. Select any one of these poems at random in a typical English Bible and start reading it. You'll soon realize that typical biblical poetry differs significantly from typical modern English poetry. You probably won't be able to discern any sort of meter or rhythm to the psalm and it's unlikely that you'll notice any rhymes in your English Bible translation. If you read the psalms in Hebrew, you might be able to discern a meter or rhythm, but you still probably won't see much in the way of rhymes. That's because Hebrew poetry doesn't emphasize rhyming syllables like English poetry typically does. Instead, it might be fair to say that Biblical Hebrew poetry rhymes ideas and structures rather than sounds and does so in certain uh, distinctive ways. The variety of ways in which lines relate to one another in Biblical Hebrew poetry goes by the general umbrella name, parallelism. Bishop Robert Louth gets a lot of credit these days for drawing Biblical scholars' attention to the phenomenon of parallelism in Biblical Hebrew poetry through a series of lectures he gave that were first published in Latin in 1753 and in English translation in 1787. In Lecture 19, Louth identified three types of parallelism or relationships between poetic lines. Usually these lines come in couplets or bicola, that is, sets of two lines related parallelistically, or in triplets or tricola, sets of three lines. Sets of four lines or more are not unheard of, but are much less common. Now before I describe Loth's three types of parallelism, let me acknowledge that so much work has been done on parallelism since the 1750s that Louth's categories now seem overly simplistic. Each of Louth's categories forms an extremely big tent under which many more specific parallelistic strategies can gather. I particularly recommend Adele Berlin's book, Dynamics of Biblical Parallelism, now available in a revised and expanded edition as a thorough introduction to the many varieties of biblical parallelism. In this short video, I will present Louth's categories because of their historical importance and because of their accessibility to readers just learning about parallelism for the first time. For the same reason, I will also focus on semantic or meaning-based parallelism rather than grammatical syntactical or form-based parallelism because readers who encounter the Psalms in translation will find semantic parallelism much easier to perceive than grammatical parallelism. So in Lecture 19, Louth speaks of synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism, and synthetic parallelism. In synonymous parallelism, the lines of a parallelistic unit express similar ideas. In antithetical parallelism, the lines of a parallelistic unit express contrasting ideas. And in synthetic parallelism, the lines of a parallelistic unit are bound together by their construction, but not in a synonymous or antithetical fashion. In this video, we'll use Psalm 1 as our specimen text. Pause the video for a moment and read Psalm 1 for yourself. Try to identify parallelistic units as you go through the psalm. When you come back, I'll show you some of the parallelistic units that I perceive in Psalm 1. Psalm 1, verse 2, fits well into Loth's category of synonymous parallelism. The psalmist writes of people whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. In both lines, the object of the action is God's law, called the law of the Lord in the first line, and his law in the second line. In the first line, the subject delights in that law, and if one delights in the law of the Lord, one is likely to meditate upon that law, as the second line says. The second line thus expresses an idea similar to the first, so this couplet or bicolon exhibits synonymous parallelism. Check out verse 5 for another synonymous bicolon. Verse 1 contains a synonymous tricolon. Psalm 1 ends with a bicolon that exhibits antithetical parallelism. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The semantic contrast between the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked should be pretty obvious, and one might suppose that if the Lord is watching over a person, that person should not easily perish. Again, it's easy to see how the two lines of this couplet express contrasting ideas. 
Now some people find Louth's category of synthetic parallelism a bit more difficult to understand and in some descriptions it comes off almost as a none of the above category. However, synthetic parallelism is more than mere juxtaposition. The lines of a synthetically parallelistic bicolon or tricolon should exhibit a clear structural or formal relationship to one another. In Psalm 1, the first bicolon of verse 3 reads, They are like trees planted by streams of water. In this bicolon, the second line clearly extends the thought of the first, describing what kind of trees certain people are. Planted by streams of water neither echoes nor contrasts with they are like trees, but it extends the thought in a distinct and helpful way. Some scholars like to use letters to identify the sense of a parallelistic unit, and this scheme might help you to recognize parallelism more easily. The pattern in a synonymously parallelistic couplet is A and near A, more or less, with near A usually designated as A prime. The pattern in an antithetically parallelistic couplet is A and not A, and the pattern in a synthetically parallelistic couplet is A and B, where B has a clearly explicable relationship to A. In this video, we've only scratched the surface of the parallelistic relationships between lines of Hebrew poetry. If you want to go further, you could read Chapter 2 of David Peterson and Kent Harold Richards' book, Interpreting Hebrew Poetry, and then, after you learn some Hebrew, explore Adele Berlin's excellent dynamics of biblical parallelism. But even an understanding of parallelism that never advances beyond Louth's simple categories can help you better appreciate one of the most basic aesthetic features of biblical Hebrew poetry.